is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have coming in from the Jefferson State in Oregon, uh, David West. He's a uh, producer, he makes uh, short films, uh, quite a few of them, and uh, we're going to uh, talk about those. Uh, he's an anarchist, of course, and that's why he's on our program. And uh, many of his films are very anarchist-based, including one he did on the state of Jefferson. And uh, we're going to play a, f a minute or two of just one of the uh, uh, short films he did called... Um, liberation and uh, it's a very well done so I, I want to play a couple minutes of that and then we'll come back and ask him how he became an anarchist So as you can see, interesting stuff. Uh, he's do he's doing lots of stuff. He's uh, sorry, I got a fly on my nose here. Uh, the uh, he's sounds like he's working on something new at the moment. So we're going to ask him all about that as soon as I get rid of this fly out of my face here. And uh, but the very first thing I have to ask you, uh, David, is how did you become an anarchist? Uh, well, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version here. I uh, I grew up out in the middle of nowhere in Northern California. So you know, kind of right from the beginning, I probably had. A bit of a propensity towards being a rugged individualist. I started, uh, you know, openly identifying as a libertarian when I was in high school. Um, you know, this was, that was uh, when Ron Paul was running for president the first time in 2008. I, uh, well, you know, the first time as a Republican. And uh, I started, you know, really liking him. You know, I, uh, I grew up in a, a very conservative Christian environment and I was always kind of like, like, wh why the hell do you have a right to throw someone in jail for smoking weed? Like, that, that seems stupid, you know? If I can own any gun I want, why can't someone own weed? And, you know, so I started uh, having very strong libertarian leanings from the get-go. Unfortunately, uh, I was not completely an anarchist yet. And uh, I, um, I, I was very much one of those, uh, like, minarchists who loves national defense. So, when I was 18, I, uh, after I graduated high school, I joined the Army. And uh, long story short, after I went to Iraq, I kind of realized that was a bunch of bullshit. And, um, you know, I, I'm overseas and I'm like, what the hell? I thought I was coming here to, you know, bring these people freedom and protect the oppressed people of Iraq and liberate them. And here I am basically just going door to door and arresting people for no reason, taking their guns. I was like, this is ridiculous. And um, that sort of woke me up. And... Uh, you know, I was finally like, well, I've always thought taxes are a necessary evil. Now I think that war isn't even necessary. So there goes the necessary part of taxation. And uh, now they're just evil. And so I was like, oh, sh shit, am I, am I an anarchist? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm like 19 at the time in Iraq as I'm realizing all this. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I started, I started doing a lot of research. I actually put in, after I got back from Iraq, I'd been in the military only about a year and a half. I put in for discharge as a conscientious objector. I just felt like I'd been completely conned. And, um, uh, you know, I'd already started, I'd already realized I was an anarchist. I'd already started... Uh, you know, basically having all these anarcho-capitalist voluntarist ideals and um, sort of internalizing them. And then as I was doing research for my conscientious objection paperwork, um, you know, I had to find like examples of uh, other people who'd gotten out of the military for similar reasons, uh, you know, because they're like, well, what, you're not a pacifist? They, they couldn't wrap their mind around the idea that I was, I would turned into like an anti-war, anti-government person who owned a lot of guns. <laughs> um, so, uh, that made it a little bit difficult. It took what should have taken about four months for me to get out, took like 13 cause they were putting stonewalled. But, um, in that process, I, I started doing research and, um, uh, you know, I was always really leery of any source I'd find. I'd be like, this is probably just some liberal nonsense. Cause at the time I thought it was only liberals that agreed with me. And I actually stumbled across an article that I really liked. And I was still a little leery of it, but as I started reading more and more of the site, I was like, wow, these are people that think just like me. And it was lourockwell.com. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that was when I first, you know, I'd already realized I was an anarchist, but that was when I learned about the terms, you know, anarcho-capitalism and voluntarist. And that was when I, uh, you know, sort of came out as an anarchist. And uh, that was, would have been like early 2010. So... Wow, that's great. So many uh, interesting things you just brought up. And uh, thank you for your service. And when I say that, I mean for quitting the army. Um, <laughs> you're, you can get on the plane before me because of that, um, but not because you're in the military. Um, yeah, so many interesting things you just brought up. I don't know where to start. Um, but uh, let's, let's talk a bit more about the military side, because there's so many people in the military today that I hear from that uh, are, are like you, they kind of want out. And I'm not sure uh, that um, all of them know that that is actually is an option. Um, so you conscientiously objected and you had to go through some sort of process and then they, they let you out of the gang? Yeah, yeah. Um I wish it was that simple. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how viable an option it actually is. Granted, I was uh, I was a ranger, so I was in like a you know an all male elite light infantry unit where no one had done the whole conscience objector thing since like the 80s. So no one there really knew how to handle it. I'm sure in other units it might be a little bit easier, um, but uh, where I was, yeah, everyone you know. Like I said, even though the army regulations don't say you have to be a pacifist, they just say you have to have a sincere objection to war in all forms. And my thinking was, well, I hate government in all forms now, so <laughs> therefore I kind of hate everything that's not just, you know, individualistic self-defense. And, uh, you know, so I, I had to basically write essays about, you know, how, what my beliefs were, why they changed, how they changed. Oh. And... Um, and then, you know, that would get approved by like a bunch of steps in my chain of command. And then finally, like the post general, someone who's never met me, had any interactions with me would like deny it. And I'd have to write, um, I'd have to write like uh, an appeal saying, well, this is why I think that, you know, you should let me out. And uh, it just kept getting stonewalled like every turn. And finally, the only reason I actually got out without it taking any longer was because uh, my company got a new first sergeant. And when he kind of learned about my situation, he took me aside one day and he was like, look, West, um, you know, I don't completely agree with you, but uh, I am kind of sick of our guys getting killed overseas. So I, I can sort of see where you're coming from. And uh, I think it's ridiculous the way they've been treating me. And he kind of actually helped expedite things. And uh, yeah, because I was almost to the point where it was like, shit, I'm just going to have to go AWOL because this is taking way too long. <laughs> But uh, I, I wow. pretty much, yeah, it, it took 13 months from the time I put in the paperwork. And according to Army regulations, it should have been like four months or something. So if, if anyone else wants to do that, you know, if there's any listeners right now, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I'd be glad to help you. But uh, be prepared for a difficult road. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, very interesting to hear. Um, 
What, what's your view on when you were in the military, what the other uh, people in the military were thinking? Because you were obviously seeing this as not being what uh, they sign, you signed up for, uh, what you thought it was. Uh, did, did, were there a lot of other people in the military that were like you, or were they mostly not thinking about these sort of things? It's, it's interesting. Um, you know, since I was in a very, like, meathead, you know, frat boy light infantry unit, um, uh, you, you know, I, I, to, to be a ranger, you have to join the army, you have to volunteer for airborne school, volunteer to be a ranger. So it's sort of as like, it's, it's the guys that really want to be there. You know, the kind of guys that actually do just like, want to kill people oftentimes. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah, I found, you know, it was a lot of the attitudes of the guys I was with that really started horrifying me in the first place. You know, I joined for God and country thinking I was going to be doing something great for America, doing something good for Iraq. And then I start seeing guys that don't believe any of that at all. And, um, you know, or have some pretty horrifying worldviews. And so that was what kind of started waking me up in the first place. And, um, you know, like, like for example, my company commander one time, he said, uh, a guy in our company had been killed on the previous deployment and he said, okay, that's okay. Next deployment, we're going to get revenge when we go to Afghanistan. Now, keep in mind, this guy died in Iraq. We're going to get revenge when we go to Afghanistan and put all the fucking Muslims to sleep. So, you know, I, I hear stuff like that. I'm like, wow, I'm with a bunch of sociopaths. At the same, at the same time, when I came out and put in my paperwork as a conscientious objector, um, guys kind of came out of the woodwork and started like talking about my beliefs. Like there were a lot of guys that just thought I was an idiot, but there were a lot of like mostly lower enlisted guys, you know, all the guys who re up and re up, you know, time and time again, uh, the guys have been in for six, eight, 10, 12 plus years. Uh, they were all just kind of morons in my opinion, but, uh, a lot of the smarter, younger guys who was the first enlistment who weren't planning on re upping were like, yeah, I kind of agree with you. Um, which didn't surprise me. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people get suckered into, into doing it. They don't all end up getting out as conscientious objectors, but there were more people who were sympathetic to my ideals than I'd actually realized at first. A lot of them were just kind of riding it out and, you know, flying under the radar. Very interesting. I'm enjoying all these perspectives. I haven't uh, heard all these before. Um, I want to just ask one more question about the military, then we'll mm -hmm. move on. Um, one of the things that I sort of find uh, almost always in the U.S., no other country really has this love of the military like the U.S. So they've, they've just got this propaganda right. down yeah. that these are the heroes and every movie in the theater is about some war where there's American heroes saving somebody. Um, and so when I'm out in public or talking or writing uh, and I, I, I say some very anti-military things, there's always some mother somewhere uh, who gets very angry because her son, who's the perfect child, uh, he may be or might not be, but, you know, every mom thinks her son's perfect, um, is in the military. So how dare I? Uh, do you ever get into these conversations or have you run across this sort of thing and how do you deal with it? Absolutely. Like one, one of the big things that I always tell people, because yeah, it's exactly what you're saying. Everyone, it's always, you know, their son, their nephew, their grandson or whatever is in the military. And they just think he's like the most noble person ever. You know, like all, I have a lot of friends who join the military and like, it's funny, like I'll be, you know, at church or something and the pastor will say, oh, you know, so-and-so wants you to pray for their grandson uh, in Iraq and everyone just waxing poetic about what a noble young man he is. And, you know, I'm thinking having talked to him outside of like a church environment, I'm like, this guy literally is the kind of guy who has like pictures of, of a guy executing, um, a middle Eastern woman with a pistol on his arm. He always talks about how he wants to like kill Hodge and stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, the only reason people have such a rosy view of all their, you know, family members is because of, you know, emotional blindness and they've just never been around that person in the context of a military environment. It's the same thing with police officers, you know, everyone thinks that, oh, there's plenty of good cops out there because they have one good cop friend who's a buddy who's fun to hang out and have a beer with, but they don't realize how horribly he might treat people on the job. And, uh, you know, the other thing I've, I've had some, if, if you want to hear about my most extreme interaction like that, I think this guy was actually a veteran. Uh, about a year after I was out, not even that, about six months after I was out, I was doing an anti-war protest and uh, I had a, a flag flying upside down. Well, now, when I do an anti-war protest, I usually open carry a rifle. I want to fly the flag that, hey, I'm not a hippie and I'm anti-war. You, you don't have to be a pacifist hippie to be anti-war. 
long story short, a dude pulls up next to me in his truck and uh, tries to get me to come over to his window. And I thought he was going to like you know, throw his spitter on me or something. And uh, so I just kind of was like, no, I, I'm, I'm close enough. I'm only like 10 feet away, dude. I can hear you. And uh, he kind of looked around and he pulled a knife. So he was like trying to get me up close to his window to knife me. He was wearing a Navy SEAL hat. He pulled like an 8-inch fixed blade knife on me. Like, like, bear in mind, I have an AR-15 on my chest, so I assume he thought that was a toy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 there was no round chambered on my rifle, just a loaded magazine. And so when he pulls out this knife, I just sort of step back. I put my hand, I throw back my jacket, and put my hand on my 45. And I'm like, sir, I'm not here to start a fight. But if you start one, I'll finish it. And his eyes bugged out of his head like a saucer, and he stammers for words. He's like, well, I, 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 I'm not afraid of that. You know, I'm, I'm an old <laughs> knife fighter. I can, I'll take you. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, well, you're not making much of a move to take me now that you know I have a gun. <laughs> and uh, he actually, you know, we kind of argued there for a minute. And then the uh, stoplight he was stopped at by the corner where I was demonstrating turned green, and he drove off. And as he's driving off, he says, well, you know, um, fine. You want a gunfight? I'll give you a gunfight. I'll be back in... I'll be back in an hour with guns to fucking kill you. And as I look at him, I just, you know, grabbed the bolt on my AR and jacked in around and I said, you do that. And I knew he was full of shit. And uh, he drove off, parked down the street and called the cops on me. Or uh, he, excuse me, he got on the phone and I hoped he was calling the cops. And I was like, oh, please show up. I have video and like three witnesses to show that, you know, you just threatened to murder me. And uh, nothing ever showed, nothing ever came of it. I kept my eye out for the next hour or two that I was there. Nothing happened. But So, yeah, I've, I've had some pretty interesting interactions with rabid military worshippers, to say the least. Unbelievable. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I was born in Canada, and uh, I've lived all around the world. Uh, so I, I've never been surrounded by this sort of lunacy of this military worship. Uh, but when I go to the U.S., I actually have one experience. <laughs> and this is before I was a full anarchist. I was still... Uh, figuring out my ideas on on these things I was still just searching it was around 2002 I was in New York I went to Madison Square Garden and uh, so this was after 9-11 so I didn't realize how much things had changed and um, uh, in Canada like 20 years ago when I used to go to I went to a hockey game I think or it was a basketball game or something but in Canada I used to go to hockey games all the time and, uh, and the national anthem was like almost like not a big deal like people would be like mingling walking around some people wouldn't even stand it just it wasn't a big deal uh, that all has changed now though unfortunately Canada has become a lot more like the US in the last 10 or 20 years uh, they're very uh, patriotic and very nationalistic now uh, which is horrible but so, so I was in Madison Square Garden and and I didn't realize uh, what had all changed, and the national anthem was on, and I was just walking in to find my seat, and, uh, sorry, the fly has returned. Uh, this, and uh, so I asked the, uh, the, the, whatever they call those people who uh, help you find your seats or whatever, and I said, I said it really quietly, because I could tell, like, everyone was standing, and it, was, it seemed all very serious, so I didn't want to, like, make a, like, an ass of myself and, like, be all loud. I just said, uh, excuse me, uh, where's, could you just tell me where my seat is, and I'll, go. and he went off on me. Uh, he started shouting at me. He starts pointing at the fly. He goes, do you know what that is? Do you know what that is? I was looking at it, and I went, well, I'm Canadian, <laughs> and he's like, he's just going crazy. Like, I, I almost got beat up. Um, so yeah, it's it's wild. Um, oh, yeah. Let's uh, yeah, go ahead if you have. Uh, oh, I was just gonna say yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. I've never had anything quite that crazy in regards to that, but I've been to when Ron Paul was running in 2012. You know, I did some campaigning for him. I became a Republican precinct committee person, and uh, I got some really dirty looks at some like Republican functions when I didn't stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. It was really funny, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Another angle I want to bring into this, and we're going to get into talking about your, your films and stuff like that right after this, but it's so interesting, this stuff to me, uh, is your Christian side and uh, how the Christians in the U.S. are so many are so pro-war. Um, and and like you brought up, they seem to think that there is this battle between the, the, that it is good to go and kill Muslims. Um, what's your thoughts on that whole angle? Because I don't uh, get it. <laughs> That that whole angle disgusts me. I mean, that's basically two two of my two of my biggest and most viewed short films are basically about exactly that, about how I think it's sick that Christians often just want to kill Muslims or whatever. Um, oh, I mean, I could I could go on about this for a long time. I mean, as someone who's in the church, I butt heads with people often on this, and um, you know, I, I I spare them no mercy. I. Uh, 
I, I've irritated a lot of people at church probably by telling the truth. But at the same time, you know, I've, um, you know, I've, I've met a lot of people who are appreciative in the church of what I'm doing. So, especially, especially in like the younger demographic, there's a much more libertarian view towards war among Christians. Um, it's mostly, you know, your, your older and middle-aged conservatives that are, that are really awful on it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like, like my short film, Liberation, was basically axed from a Christian film festival, most likely because it was sort of anti-government and anti-war and criticized, you know, people who want to uh, kill Muslims, uh, you know, throw, throw drug users and homosexuals in prison, that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm I, I, I'm spent a lot of time. That's like one of the big things I do in my films is criticize, uh, you know, sort of these fascistic Christians. Yeah, it's it's bizarre to me. I, I read the Bible once because I I figured I should read it. It's pretty popular, so I read it. I didn't see anything about Jesus saying to kill Muslims or anything like that. So where where <laughs> where are they getting this these ideas? Um, I'm, yeah, I mean, obviously Jesus could have even said that since Muhammad wasn't around to like 600, <laughs> 700 AD. Um, who knows? I mean, a lot of it is just, you know, tradition and religion's been so warped a lot of times to support all sorts of oppressive ideologies. I mean, that's religious fervor has been as much as Christians always want to, well, at least the conservative Christians that I grew up around want to talk about the dangers of liberals and, you know, socialists and stuff. Most of the worst things that have happened to this country, in my opinion, have come more directly from, uh, you know, from these like Christian moralists who want to force their views on everybody. I mean, the war on drugs, prohibition, uh, even slavery to some extent, the civil war, can all be traced pretty directly to, you know, this sort of perverted Christianity. Yeah, it's so. mostly just people with a lot of really warped views just, uh, like, tying it in with the Christian thing, right? Because, like, Jesus drank wine at his final supper or whatever it was called. Uh, I'm not ta- I haven't, As you can tell, I haven't really looked into a lot of these things too deeply. Uh, but um, in, then they supported prohibition, you know. Um, it, it just doesn't make any sense. They're just sort of... I, uh, I don't know. I, I, I just don't get it. I don't know how they can have these cognitive dissonances in their head about what they say they believe, uh, which is Jesus and the things that Jesus talked about, and then the things they're doing, which is totally not anything that I don't. I don't think Jesus would be a big fan of the Iraq War, for example. No, and, and it cracks you up how hypocritical a lot of Christians are, in that you know I hear from people all the time. They'll just tell me. Um, Christians will tell me things like, oh, well, you know, Romans 13 says to obey the authorities. And, you know, Matthew 22, Jesus says to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And they somehow extrapolate that out into, you know, everything the U.S. government does is right. And then hilariously, then, you know, they'll criticize Obama or something. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's only right. It's only wrong if, you know, the other side does it. But Yeah, some people just have a mess in their head of just opposing ideas on like every different angle it's, it must be a, a terrible uh, way to live um, let's talk a bit about your uh, movie making because I'm really uh, supportive of this um, I'm actually going to have on I've already had on uh, the guys from Uncle Samta uh, who are producing a, a very libertarian, very anarchist-style uh, uh, kids' Christmas movie. Uh, and I'm going to have on uh, another one uh, who's uh, producing uh, short films as well. Very, This is extreme libertarian sort of uh, <laughs> short films. It's going to be very interesting, things like uh, Bitcoin uh, assassination lists and stuff like that, like very <laughs> futuristic, extreme libertarian now, we, sort we, of stuff. Are we, are we talking like documentary or fictional narrative there? Uh, fictional narrative. Nice, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, uh, that'll. I'm be interviewing him probably next week. So uh, maybe all you guys can get connected and do stuff together. Uh, That'd absolutely. be great too. It's always good to know. And that's people. that's sort of what I'm I'm sort trying to uh, help uh, get out there is uh, for anarchists. Uh, uh, one of the best ways that we can get our message out there is through entertainment. And uh, film is uh, one of uh, film and music. And I've just had on a few rappers recently who are anarchists. Uh, so I'm really supporting them, uh, and I, I'd always been saying for years, oh, we need some more. An- we need one anarchist uh, film producer out there doing like really anarchist-style uh, messaged uh, films, even if it's not totally overtly. At, at least it's uh, if you if you know what's going on, you can really see it. 
And now there's a, a bunch coming out. Like I said, I'm going to have three uh, anarchist film producers on in the next couple of weeks. So uh, it's really happening. So I really want to support and promote what you're doing and to try to connect you with the, as much of the anarchist community as possible. Perhaps there's some really amazing actors out there. So perhaps there's uh, some really good script writers. Uh, everyone should try to uh, get together and, uh, and uh, co- uh, cooperate and coordinate uh, to get the, the best products out there. So when did you start producing uh, films? Um, I mean, it's something I've always wanted to do, you know, I, 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 growing up, um, you know, I grew up out in the middle of nowhere and uh, about 60 miles from a stoplight. So, you know, we drive an hour to an hour and a half just to one way to get groceries. And, uh, you know, my mom tells me that even when I was like two years old, I would spend an entire car ride telling relatively coherent stories and, you know, coherent by two year old standards. And, um, so I've always been very much a storyteller and had a lot that I wanted to say and a lot of stories I wanted to tell. When I was in high school, I dabbled a little bit, like middle school and early high school, I dabbled a little bit with um, stop motion animation. I'd animate little Lego guys and stuff. Um, you know, but that, that was never a great medium because the stuff I wanted to do was always way too complicated for that, that medium. Um, Towards when I was a little later in high school, you know, I didn't even have a camera, but I would sometimes borrow a crappy old mini DV camcorder from a friend, and we'd ma- I made a couple short films that way, um, and uh, so it's, it's it's always been like what I wanted to do with my life. You know, I just had that little uh, I, I was going to join the army first and do that, and I felt like I needed to serve my country before I did what I really wanted to, and uh, so it wasn't until I got out of the army in 2010 that I really seriously started doing it. And uh, I got out at the end of 2010 and uh, all of 2011, I kind of researched filmmaking and I wanted to do it, but I was working full time at a roofing company. So that wasn't really happening. And uh, finally I quit that job and like two months later I completed a short film. So I've really been doing filmmaking like seriously and, f- and sort of full time since like uh, late 2011 so just for just for two three years now great and you've done quite a few so um what's involved with doing let, let, let's just take uh, liberation for example it's about uh 15 minutes long <laughs> is that about right yeah 18 minutes yeah uh so what's all involved in, in making a production like that just so people know and people uh who might want to do these sort of things themselves um i mean everything that i've done is super low budget so I mean, like Liberation is the most expensive film I've made, and that cost less than eight hundred dollars. Um, you know, so so most of the like production responsibilities fell on me, or uh, you know, a couple of the other lead actors who are my friends that I've known forever, who want to be actors and want to want to get into that field. Um, so I mean, I uh, I wrote the script, I scouted locations. Um, that that one is an interesting one because. It was made for a a Christian speed filmmaking competition. So the idea was that uh, every every team that entered, uh, part of the $800 uh, budget I mentioned was like 168 of that was spent just on the entry fee for the contest. Um, (laughs) And uh, this is the one that I paid to enter and then was excluded from for making an anti-government film. Uh, (laughs) Every team was assigned a different Bible verse and then we had to write a script based on that Bible verse. We had 10 days to write a script and kind of plan the film and then seven days to actually shoot, edit and turn it in. Wow. So it was made very fast. The version you see online, I did spend a few weeks afterwards polishing up more and, you know, editing stuff more and, uh, you know, uh, putting in a few scenes that had landed on the cutting room floor for the, the shorter contest requirements. But, um, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot that goes into even a short film, especially one as involved as that one. You know, I had to find locations. It was hard to find a location that I could use as a, uh, a like near future prison camp <laughs> uh, on the kind of budget I have. Um, I ended up finding an abandoned dam that worked fantastically. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's finding locations, getting actors, you know, writing your script shot listing everything you know you go through the script and you either storyboard it which takes a long time and i suck at drawing or what i do is i shot list it since i'm my own cinematographer and i run my own camera i don't need like a picture to show exactly what i want i have it mostly in my head so instead what i do is i do what's called shot listing where i just go through the script and i break it down like okay now here i envision it cutting to this character over his shoulder and here it's a close-up of his eye or you know whatever and i make it a list a map of the film 
so that I know exactly what shots I need. And for liberation, it was, you know, it was like 300, 350 individual shots um, that I then had to get in uh, four days of shooting. Um, so, and, I, and with that film, it was interesting because I didn't actually have time to fully shot list it. I shot the film more or less chronologically, and the whole second half is like escaping this prison. Uh, I, I knew the script, and I knew where it went, but because it was such a, a short time limit for the competition, it wasn't shot listed, and I'm just making it up as I go. So you're kind of keeping track of this this puzzle that's going together in your head. Okay, I got to put this shot here. Got to do that. Now I need this so that these two scenes flow together. And uh, it's it's an involved process. I look forward to having more of a budget someday, so I can kind of delegate some of these jobs out to people, you know, and I can focus on writing and directing. But, uh, <laughs> and, and then of course when it's done now, I edit everything. I do all the post-production. Um, I have no musical abilities, so I do have a, a fantastic composer that works with me a lot and writes all the music. <laughs> That's great. Um, and, uh, just on that note, on the music note, I just had on a few rappers. Um, so if us anarchists can kind of get together a little bit more and, uh, uh meet each other and, uh, each of us have our own talents and work together on certain projects. I think that would be phenomenal. And sort of a funny sort of side note, I was, uh, I told you this last night, I was out in Acapulco a couple of nights ago uh, with a client at dinner and there was this big film crew there, uh, about 50 people. So I knew it was like a fairly decent size, whatever they were doing. And uh, I didn't know what it was, but it was that uh, they were just following these kids around. I asked somebody, uh, like 18 year old kids, and um, I asked somebody what it was and they said, it's a reality show. So that's all I knew. <laughs> So uh, my client uh, ended up going home and I thought, I'm going to just sit here and have a drink and just sort of watch and, and see what happens. It's a reality show. Maybe I'll get sucked into it somehow or another. And sure thing, uh, one of the actresses comes over to my table with like five cameras behind her. And I, I knew I, it was basically I was acting uh, because, uh, you know, I, I knew what was going on. I, I didn't need to see the cameras. So I, I decided to sort of act a little bit. And uh, what it kind of, uh, I told you this the other night was, it kind of reawoke something in me because when I was like 10, uh, I was in a lot of plays and I was a little, a really good little actor. And, um, and then I just sort of went off. I never thought about it again after I was about 14. At around 14, I, I became very shy for some reason and uh, very, uh, I just couldn't talk out in public very much uh, for years, uh, so I kind of lost all that. But just being in this short production, uh, and I think it will air because the things I said were interesting, and it was quite anarchy-based, uh, <laughs> uh, what I said. Nice. Uh, it's, it's, it's called Acapulco Shore, which will be coming out in September. It's all in Spanish, and I was speaking Spanish in the show. Uh, it's basically the Jersey Shore of Mexico, so that'll be interesting. But uh, I guess my point is that uh, even a person like myself, I wouldn't mind getting involved in some of these productions in one way or another. I don't know if I would do a good job, though, because I haven't done it in, in decades. So if, if someone wants to get me involved in some sort of small role just to, to see if I can do it and, and totally know that I might be horrible and just you might have to find someone else, I'd be open to doing that. And I think um, if you think about places like you're in Jefferson State, there's a, a fair amount of libertarians and anarchists there. Wow. Uh, so uh, what us anarchists should be trying to do is, is it's to have a bit more of a community like you do in Jefferson State, a uh, little bit similar like what they have in New Hampshire. And, uh, and everyone worked together on these sort of things. So if someone's good at script writing, someone's good at music, someone's good at, you know, and, and get this content out there because that is amazing to me. That really surprised me that you did that 18 minute short film, very good quality uh, in uh, a couple of weeks for $800. So it just goes to show what can be done. And then if you had more resources, what more could be done. And I think you're working on something right now. Is that correct? Yeah, I am. I have a short film called Occam's Razor that uh, I've, it's been sort of on the back burner for a long time and working on it here and there for like the last year. And uh, it's finally almost done. And uh, I'm releasing on the 23rd. I have a trailer out right now. It, it's funny that you bring up, um, you know, wanting libertarians and anarchists to kind of uh, all, all work together on stuff. <laughs> uh, because I have a... You know, I, I want to make feature films. I mean, no one's dream is to be stuck making short films forever. Um, one second, I'm going to stop my camera and restart it. It died a second sure. ago because it can only record for so long before it... Uh, that's a government uh, regulation, you know that? Really? Yeah, it uh, can only record for like a certain amount of time. Uh, uh, if it records longer than that, it's considered a video camera, and then there's extra taxes, so they... Huh. <laughs> so the government's screwing with us again here. That's funny. Yeah, it, it just goes to sleep. I always assume it's like a battery function. Oh, it could be. It could and, be that. And, too. Anyway, um, so uh, 
No, anyway, so I, I want to make feature films, and I have a film that I've been developing a story for for years, since like 2009, and um, it's, uh, it's a very, very libertarian, very anarchic story, um, m- much more so than anything I've even done so far uh, for a feature film. It's called The Smoking Gun, and it's a modern-day western about the war on drugs. And, um, you know, when I, when I make it, I've wanted to make it for a long time and I've kind of tried getting it off the ground a few times, but it's, it'll take significant money. I mean, it's something only a couple hundred thousand to make. So I'm, I'm planning on doing another much smaller feature film about six months from now, one that's less libertarian, but still has some strong libertarian themes in it. Uh, I figure if I get that feature film done, it'll be easier for me to get the money that I really need to do the smoking gun later. But when I make the smoking gun, you know, I, I have several... Um, very well-known anarchists who are interested in uh, playing a part in it and um, being involved in it. And I, I want to sort of do, you know, a big, a lot of crowdfunding for it. And the, the slogan that I'm going to have sort of for it as it's being made is by libertarians for liberty. I just want to have as many, you know, of the production team be, you know, ideologically aligned with the film as possible. Um, just because I think, I think it'll be a better product in every way then, and it'll, it'll probably cost less too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's all about, you know, it's all about the drug war. I shouldn't say too much cause this is still, you know, a, probably at least two or three years from happening. But, uh, um, yeah, that, that's, I definitely have some big plans for libertarian film. I'm hoping to take it. I, I like to say, I want to take the libertarian conspiracy to rule the world and leave everyone alone to Hollywood. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I want to make movies that are that are strongly libertarian, um, just full on, you know, expressing an, an anarcho libertarian ideology, but that are good enough stories and you know, good enough action adventure films in their own right that they'll actually appeal to a broad demographic. Because right now, the few libertarian, like explicitly libertarian films that have been made, are pretty niche. You know, they're really only appeal to people within the liberty movement, if that. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. I, uh, we need a lot more of that. So that's great that you have that in your plans. Um, so maybe what we should do is get your uh, information out there on this uh, Anarchast. And then uh, when you're uh, starting to make plans for the smoking gun uh, and do some crowd raising, uh, we can uh, have you back on and, and start to get some uh, interest generated and in getting that done as well. So why don't you let people know any final comments you'd like to say and uh, let people know how they can contact you and see some of your films. Yeah, uh, if you want to watch my films or get in touch with me, um the best way to do that is probably through my Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash buck the system. Uh, I also have a website. It's buck the system dot TV. Um, but I mean, that's just, I just post stuff there. It's not really a good way to get in touch with me or anything. So go to my Facebook page, like it. I've got about 15, 1600 followers. Uh, you know, I, I post all my movies there. You can kind of interact, get in touch with me. Um, if you're a, a fellow, uh, you know, anarchist, uh, filmmaker, by all means, uh, reach out, get in touch. I know a handful of uh, anarchist filmmakers already, and it's always good to know more. Yeah, awesome. So we'll have the links to that down below. And I really uh, uh, want to say again to all the anarchists out there, uh, I hear a lot of uh, uh, younger anarchists are, are sitting there in the U.S. They say, that, oh, I'm, there's nothing I can do to change the world. Uh, this is how you change it. You create uh, this sort of content that actually uh, 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 wakes people up to these ideas. And so uh, definitely look into it, uh, get involved, contact uh, David, um, or just, uh, just get involved or create your own production. And the more, the better. And uh, and I can't wait to see them all starting to come out. And it's going to be exciting. So I'd like to thank David for being on. And uh, this has been Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. This is Anarchast. <laughs>